This is the first recorded feud that Clay Jones would take part in. It is very interesting that his home life involved a Holbrook and an Underwood, and then he would be caught up in the Holbrook-Underwood War. We will walk with Clabe through this particular feud all the way up to his first meeting with Bad John Wright. And what he says about Wright is kind of shocking, especially taking into account that Wright and Jones had a huge feud of their very own later on that would make national news. There is a whole lot to the Underwood and Holbrook feud itself, and while we gently touch upon the reasons behind the conflict, our main focus is upon Clay Jones at the moment. We will come back to the feud itself in our feud section and touch on how it led to the Rowan County War of 1884-1887. through 1887. All aboard the Kentucky-Tennessee Living Time Machine! Please fasten your seatbelts and keep your arms and legs inside of the vehicle at all times. But to get going, we need your help. We still need to fire up the time machine to transport us. Please help us by clicking the like, subscribe, and bell notification buttons down below. Not only does this fire up the time machine, but it convinces YouTube that we need a bigger time machine to reach more people who love history as much as you do. Now, back to our story. Clabe and Chrissy After the Civil War, Jones returned to Boonesville to stay with his mother for a short time. He moved to Big Sinking Creek in Carter County, Kentucky, and lived there eight years with his wife, Chrissy Holbrook Jones. This was not a very happy eight years. There were constant arguments and squabbles, and Chrissy would leave for a week at a time and come back home again to Clabe. Finally, the two had enough and would separate for a time. Clabe gave Chrissy all she wanted out of the house and fifty dollars and the understanding that she would not come back to him or bother him any more. She agreed and took up with a man named Underwood and they moved to Ohio together. Underwood was not kind to Chrissy and so she became a victim of domestic crimes. Underwood took all of her money and sent her away from him. She came back to Clabe asking for a reconciliation. However, during her absence, Clabe had become involved with a woman named Hanshu, and they had two children together. Chrissy was not satisfied to learn that Clabe and Hanshu had been living happily together, so she caused all kinds of trouble that she could for the couple. Trouble with the Bear and Brown Families There was trouble between Clabe and the Bear and Brown Families because of an old sweetheart of Clabe's. Lazarus Bear married Sarah Brown, who also had a younger sister. Because of the previous relationship, the Bear family decided that Jones needed to be taught a lesson. The day was set on the following Saturday at a treat at Big Springs on Sinking Creek. Their bully, Jim Brown, would be the man who would come against Jones. Unaware of the trouble brewing, Jones met up with the Bear and Brown families and began drinking moonshine with them. Everything was going fine until Jim asked Clabe if he was doing okay. After Clabe said that he was, then Jim told him that he was going to fight with him. Clabe told him to go ahead and try, and the fisticuffs began. Brown had a large natural target on his face, his nose, and Clabe hit it square, and Brown fell to the ground. Clabe then took advantage of the situation and defeated Brown without a scratch on his person. This did not satisfy the Bear family, and one of them drew out his knife on Clabe. In response, Clabe also drew out his own knife and began to dash toward him. As soon as Clabe jumped at the man, he ran and hid behind the skirts of Mrs. Amy Brown. Clabe then exclaimed, quote, Boys! There is one bear gone to hoe, unquote. The fight was over. Clabe claims that the men had it out for him after that, but that the women of the family were fine friends with him. Clabe was subbing the court for a week. While he was away, the bears came to his farm to steal his corn, broke into his smokehouse, and took all of his bacon. Clabe smoked his meat in a process called sugar-cured, 
Red peppers are used with the salting process of smoking the meat. Clabe swore out a warrant and found two sides of his bacon at the bear house and two sides of bacon at Jim's Brown's property hidden in the cliff. But this event had to be answered for. In retaliation, Clabe stole Jim Brown's fine weather sheep. A weather sheep is a male sheep that has been castrated at a younger age to keep them from becoming aggressive. Jones watched Brown take the sheep home and tie it to a tree in his yard near his home and then walk into the house. Jones then took the opportunity and untied the sheep, took it home and killed the mutton for Brown. Jim Brown looked everywhere for his sheep except for Jones' smokehouse, which Clabe had put it in. The Holbrook Underwood War There are many versions of this feud, and in most of them, Clabe Jones is mentioned at the Siege of Underwood Fort. A story of the feud officially is recorded in Mountain Sterling Gazette, as found in the Kentucky Explorer, January 1999 edition, pages 29 and 30. Quote, The quarrel began just after the war in September 1865. Jesse Underwood, the son of old George Underwood, got into a barroom quarrel with the man who called for a Jeff Davis drink. And in the fight that ensued, George Trumbo was shot and killed by Jesse. Many efforts were made by the authorities to capture Jesse, and in one of the raids on the Underwood Fort, Squire Holbrook shot and seriously wounded the young man. Thus started the feud between the two families. At length, Jesse tried to avoid so much fighting, went to Iowa, and then there was peace for a time. Hostilities were renewed, however, when old George Underwood posted bail for some men charged with horse stealing. This war was soon in full progress again, and many were killed on both sides. Clabe gives his account of the Holbrook Underwood War. But because of possible retaliation, he does tell us who was killed in the war, but doesn't give the names of those who were involved in the killing of those men. Remember, Clabe already was seeing trouble in his own house when his wife was a Hobrook, took up with a man named Underwood. Although the two events are not related, it is very interesting that once again the two surnames would enter Clabe's life. This account takes place after Jesse Underwood went to Iowa and before his return to the mountains. The Fort Underwood Siege According to Clabe, quote, The trouble began over a dogfight at the burial of Old Man Pendulum, unquote. A few days after the funeral, Alex Pendulum was bushwhacked and shot from the bush. The sniper was a member of the Holbrook clan, and the Holbrooks gave orders that no one should call a doctor to come and help the man, under threat that they would share in Alex's fate. George Underwood heard that Pendulum was shot, and immediately went for the doctor. Upon his return, Underwood was also shot in the ambush. John Martin, who was living in Carter County at the time, was given orders to leave the area or die. On leaving the area, Martin got sick and stayed with Lewis Underwood at his home to recover. Martin then recovered and stayed the night at Clabe Jones' home to try to reach a doctor at Olive Hill for his wife who was also ill. During that time, Lewis Underwood was ambushed and shot in his yard while he was going outside to get some firewood for a fire. Alvis Underwood was sent for, and he and John Martin followed the trail left by the person who had ambushed Lewis. The trail led the two men back to the home of a Holbrook. Both men returned and took Lewis to his father's home, which is now called Fort Underwood. Clay becomes involved in the feud. Miss Fina Martin took John Martin's wife home with her, and John Martin stayed at Fort Underwood. Dr. John Steele came to attend Lewis at the fort and hired Clabe to come and help, as he had a great amount of experience attending the wounded men because of the Civil War. Word was sent to Clabe by the Stamper family that if he did not leave the fort, that they would kill his children and burn his house to the ground. 
Clay sent back word to the stampers that if they had no houses, they could talk about burning his. In other words, he was telling them that if they burned down his house and killed his children, he would do the same thing to them. There were only five armed men at the Underwood Fort at that time, and they were low on ammunition and arms. However, three men would stand guard, and the other two men would kill crows, a word used in this story to mean men who were attacking them. The Stamper and Hobrooks outmanned the fort, and the Stampers attacked the fort several times. However, old George Underwood had a sister that smuggled arms and ammo into the fort to help the men there. Included in the arms was Clabe's Champagne, which was a bear gun. She also stayed with the men during the entire siege on the fort. Two men were away from the fort hidden at all times to act as snipers protecting the fort. The password for them to get back into the fort was, quote, another crow has fallen, unquote. This was to indicate that a man had been taken care of. One morning there was word sent that seven men had fallen. They were not found until some time later and their bodies were badly decomposed. The Stampers call in the law. After the bodies were found, the Stamper parties tried to call in the Sheriff of Carter County to investigate. The Sheriff flatly refused to get involved in the quarrel. The Stampers then went to Grayson to get a police force to take the fort. The police sent word that they were going to attack the fort and kill everyone inside. The Attack on the Fort Just before dawn, the attack on Fort Underwood took place. Jones was downstairs attending to the wounded when the shots rang out. Everyone began fortifying the weak places in the building and placing complete beds, mattresses, and tables to bar the windows and doors. Eventually, the ball stopped flying through the air of the fort. The occupants of the house was then able to return fire. The call for help had already been sent out for the Underwood family in the fort because they had been expecting trouble. The fight continued until 10 o'clock in the morning. Shooting stopped when Alvis Underwood's wife was sent in to tell them to surrender. The occupants refused and said they were willing to fight on. The frustrated police and men retreated the area. Seven of the police force were wounded and two were killed in the attack, and two more were dying of their wounds. During the fight, George Lewis Underwood was mortally wounded. Dr. John Steele told everyone that Underwood was going to die. So, Underwood confessed religion and asked to be baptized. So the women who were still in the fort went out to the branch and built a small dam to contain water. Underwood was carried out to this place and baptized. He died soon after this took place. According to the Roots Web website, this matter had become so large that the Kentucky Governor McCleary became involved. He sent weapons and J.N. Stewart with 40 local guardsmen to the area with the express instructions to keep the order. With the order in hand, the soldiers came to Fort Underwood and arrested the occupants except for John Martin and Clabe Jones. Both men had escaped and went to Floyd County. The entire siege lasted 19 days. Jones on the run. Even though Jones escaped the siege, it was not over for him yet. He had a reward out for his person of $700. While he was at Salt Lick, the Coburns tried to arrest him for the reward money. However, they didn't get the chance to do it as Jones still had his gun on his person and he kept them at a distance. Seeing how he was not safe in Floyd County, Jones then fled to Letcher County. He stayed with Miles Webb about five miles above Whitesburg, Kentucky. While staying with Webb, John Wright came there to ask Jones to go with him to Whitesburg. Jones explained the situation to Wright about the reward for his arrest and that he was afraid to go to town with him. Wright promised to befriend Jones and told him that he would keep him from being arrested if he went to town with him. Sure enough, as Jones and Wright rode into town on horseback, there were parties there to arrest Jones. Jones told Wright what was going on. 
Jones and Wright confronted the parties, and Wright told them that he had Jones in his charge and that no one should touch him. This saved Jones a lot of trouble, and he talks favorably about Wright and what he did for him. Later, Jones and Wright would get into their own feud that hit the newspapers everywhere. But for now, we will leave Jones in this section of the story and pick up next time with his life on the run. A special thank you. We wish to once again thank those who have helped us to gather information about the people in this series. We at Kentucky Tennessee Living could not do the amount of research and storytelling that we do without the help of some great historians and friends. We have a special list today of people that we wish to thank. A special thank you goes out to Anthony Blair and Vicki McPeak Stackett. Another very special thank you goes to Charlotte Hicks Cottle for your help with the Jones family. Thank you. We at Kentucky Tennessee Living would like to thank you for watching our video series on the Appalachian Outlaws. Don't forget to hit that like button as the more likes we receive, the more likely YouTube is to suggest our videos to other viewers. Also, to receive notice when we upload a new video, be sure to subscribe and click the bell notification button. We thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we are discovering the mysteries of Appalachian history.